Hello and welcome into the SoRare Data Show. I am Andrew Laird. You can find me as Lairdino on SoRare. Today, talking baseball with Everett Case from SoRare. He's, uh, let's see, works in product for MLB and NBA. Everett, we're getting close to the season. Welcome welcome here. Thank you. Great to, great to be here. Excited to talk some, some baseball with you. It, it's funny. I, I get like very separated from baseball when the off season happens. And then you guys came out with the, the announcement and I was like, Oh, well, I'll like get back into it. And I like clicked through, read the thing. And I was like, all right, let's check out the auctions like right now. And so, uh, I think a lot, I know a, a number of other people who have already done the same. Um, so yeah, we're excited to have baseball coming back. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us. Also, thank you to everyone who submitted some questions earlier. Uh, Everett and I are going to get through a bunch of stuff today. Uh, mostly about the upcoming 2024 MLB season, particularly on So Rare. So, and also thank everyone here uh, watching live. We do have the live chat. If there are any other questions that are in there, that you know maybe we don't cover something, or you'd like us to go over one of the details that we discuss, uh, feel free. So, Everett, since uh, you've not been on the channel before, can you just uh, tell everyone who you are? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Everett. I'm like you said, I'm on the product team here at SoRare. Uh, I've been with the company for uh, just over two years. So I joined prior to launching SoRare MLB. Uh, my mandate when joining was really to to get MLB launched, uh, which uh, we did at the All Star break a couple of years ago. Uh, and since then, I've been overseeing the gameplay experience for MLB, trying to build the best possible fantasy game for baseball fans. And over the last few months have transitioned into more of a role overseeing the same on the NBA side as well. Uh, so now in a position to kind of look across our U.S. sports portfolio and again, try to build the best possible, most fun, engaging fantasy experiences for baseball and basketball fans. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, it is nice that you've basically, I was going to say since the start, but literally like you've been there before the start. So I'm not sure there's uh, anyone better we could be hearing from about everything that's happening in 2024. The basically, what have you guys learned about the product uh, over the last one and a half year? I guess is one and a half seasons yeah. so far. Um, so, what did you guys kind of take in from that of what you thought worked and what you thought wasn't working, and kind of how you address those issues? Yeah. So. First and foremost, what I think has worked so far has been the, the gameplay and the strategy around the gameplay, the ebb and flow of the season, the game weeks mapping to season series within the season. Uh, it feels like every game week you have different and interesting lineup decisions to make, uh, which is that's the goal that, you know, that I have is to make sure that the game continues to feel strategic. What uh, in particular I felt was a success from last season was the championship chase that we ran for the postseason. So running that cumulative leaderboard that as the postseason went on, your points continued to accrue. There were reason to continue to engage throughout the postseason, uh, which, you know, the most exciting moment in time for the sport. Um, so it felt like we were able to kind of pay that back and then delivering special edition cards to the folks that were successful in the championship chase um, that was that was really well received. We were super excited about that internally, and it seemed like the community responded really well to that as well. So that's the type of execution that we're looking to do a lot more of. Um, so those are probably the the strengths um, in terms of areas of improvement. Um, I know we'll get to this at some point, I'm sure, um, but obviously rewards are always a topic of conversation and. In particular, the decision that we made this past NBA season and heading into this MLB season around the reduction of our mint counts, that obviously comes with material trade-offs. So, of course, the, the cards at decreased scarcity makes them more appealing, makes it harder to get all the cards that you might want 
uh, as we mint them uh, more slowly into a lower maximum mint count. Uh, but that also means that rewards have to be reduced as a result. And so that's an area where we're continuing to focus and invest. And you'll see that in the form of initially the reward boxes that we're rolling out. We have much bigger plans than just the, the initial in integration of reward boxes that include cards that allow people to, to win top tier cards uh, for their finishes on, in our leaderboards and, and to win market credits as well. Uh, but there's more to come in the composition of those reward boxes because obviously it's important to make sure that people feel excited about continually participating in, in the game every game week. I will say back to a quick thing you said a little earlier, those championship chase uh, reward cards are awesome. <laughs> I think both for NBA and, but, but particularly MLB, the special edition cards I'm going to use a horrible, horrible baseball pun here, but you guys knock those out of the park. Like <laughs> they're so cool. And I think when they're delivered, like we, everybody hears about them like, oh yeah, they're special editions. And then they got them and they were like, wow. Like they are, they, they produce like wow moments. So like, um, those are really cool. I'm glad you brought up, uh, the mint count thing because we, we kind of went through that with NBA and you addressed it kind of right away that the, one of the byproducts of reducing the mint count and it it's really reducing the max mint count. I don't think there were many players, at least in the limited and rare levels that even got to the, the current new uh, maximum. So Correct. I guess sort of the way that a few people were looking at it were, was if you, so you reduced it from limited from 5,000 to a thousand rare from thousand to 100, but because we never actually got to those higher numbers, why does the reward pool get smaller this year, I guess? Yeah, it's a fair it's a fair question. My response there would would basically be um, there's always been uh, a balance that we try to strike in the overall circulating supply of cards, right? And cards can enter the supply through auctions or through rewards. And obviously, for our community, winning them as a reward is better than buying them on, at the auction. But the net result is still that the supply of a particular card increases as the season goes on. And so we would be much more rapidly approaching those maximum mint counts were rewards to remain the same. Uh, so what we're trying to do is manage both the reward side and the auction supply concurrently so that we maintain a, a healthier influx of new cards into the marketplace so that we can manage the price levels and the overall supply. That's, you know, as you can imagine, this is a starting point, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we haven't even started the season yet. We've obviously revealed what the game week one rewards are going to look like. That doesn't mean that that's what they're going to look like for the duration of the season. We're obviously going to make adjustments as, as needed. The other thing that I think is important to keep in mind is uh, we have not yet introduced any special competitions to server MLB. Um, that will happen imminently. In the near term, we wanted people to focus on the introduction of the new champion competition. And obviously that, that came with it. Um, some current season card requirements. That's a, a you know an area of focus for for us internally and and for the community to make sure that they can become eligible in those competitions. So we didn't want to right out of the gate kind of muddy the waters and and make the strategy for how to attack the the new gameplay unclear. Uh, so you know special weeklies aren't coming in game week one, obviously, but we will be introducing more special competitions. And so we need to also be able to manage rewards there. We've gotten feedback um, from some of the earlier special competitions that we ran on the NBA side, where we started to be much more aggressive with running special weeklies consistently, that the rewards, if they do not comprise of card rewards or cash, were just not sufficiently appealing. And so that's an area that we wanna make sure we have cards and cash available to populate special weeklies with as we roll those out into MLB. So the initial picture of the reward profile is across the core evergreen competitions that are going to be running for the duration of the season. Uh, but that's not the end state makeup of the competitions for MLB. There's, there's more to come. And that means not just competitions, but the associated reward pools for them. 
Okay, that uh, that certainly answered a question that we got a few of was just like when are when are these special competitions coming? Because I think people obviously get excited about those types. The you mentioned that the the enthusiasm for rewards that are not cards or uh, cash or ETH that there wasn't that much, and it comes back to the I think generally it's the market credits. And there was a question in the live chat. I was going to bring it up as well. But have you guys found that there, there's been a, like, do you guys consider the market credits as a successful reward in terms of people actually utilizing them? Um, in terms of people actually utilizing them, yes. That being said, uh, would we consider it a success? Uh, not yet uh, would be my answer to that. I think... There's more work for us to do, particularly on the product side, to improve the experience of a market credit. And that just means, um, you know, the, the way that you can apply it, the way that it is explained, what the value of it is. Like, there's a lot of things that we can do to improve that experience. We certainly hear the community feedback that it doesn't, it doesn't feel sufficiently rewarding in some cases. Um, the reality is we've, we've seen them leveraged quite a bit and the fact that you can accrue them over time and use that to arrive at a fairly material discount on a card that you might have been targeting for a while, I think is compelling and it delivers more agency and choice to our managers to decide how they want to spend that credit. Um, but Job's not done as far as we're concerned in terms of you know making that a, a compelling experience. And then uh, the reward boxes that initially were are going to comprise of cards and and those market credits. There's more room for improvement there. Obviously, the you know the community hasn't seen those yet because we haven't started awarding them uh, from game week one. Um, but you know there's only two things that you can possibly win, and you know a card or a credit then it can feel like a very binary outcome. There's more yeah. to come in terms of what, what's going to eventually go into those reward boxes. Uh, that's something that we're working through across all of our sports, football, NBA, and MLB, uh, to just make reward boxes as, as compelling and exciting. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in reward boxes, and we're, we're very early in kind of realizing that potential. Okay, that's fair. Um, it, it seems like... The on the football side, we've seen a pretty significant increase in availability of like jerseys, basically jerseys, hats, so even so rear gear. And I think we obviously have to recognize that there are only, you know, a small percentage of MLB teams versus the number of football teams that you guys have licenses for. I guess it's probably around, it's probably less than 10%. But are those types of things that maybe we'd be able to see in the future? Yeah, the short answer is yes, for sure. As you noted, there's there's more uh, constraints on the MLB side, obviously, just given the, the landscape of the league. Um, but the short answer is yes, that's absolutely something that we are actively exploring. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I was gonna, I have another question that's completely unrelated to this, but um, Service to Air Missile brought it up here. It said, MLB gameplay is awesome. It feels like most people who have played who like baseball enjoy playing it. Uh, what do you feel is the biggest obstacle to overcome for mass adoption? And my question that was kind of similar to this is like, what do you guys consider to be your, not necessarily your target audience of people who will come, but like, who are you trying to sell the game to? And I, I bring this up because I actually considered doing a different show with uh, two friends of mine from back from Rotowire who are very much into fantasy baseball you know, played their season long leagues every year. They do the NFB, uh, NF, and NFBC. Yeah. N NFBC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're like hardcore fantasy baseball players, but I also find that those are the, the people who you probably struggle to try something new. It's like, oh, I've, you know, I played here forever. I played ESPN forever. I'm not going to go to Yahoo or I'm not yeah. going to do. So like, are you guys looking at targeting existing fantasy baseball players, people who just love baseball and you're like, this is actually, you know, it is fantasy baseball, but it's different. So like, who, who do you guys need to go after? Do you think? Yeah. Great, great question. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of vectors that we could approach this on. I mean, it's part of the, um, the challenge and benefit of trying to develop a, a brand new category is that 
there isn't a, a one to one. Here's the here's this version for what what so rare is. Um, I think what most of the decisions that we've made so far and how we've constructed the product and the experience has been to onboard fantasy baseball players, you know, baseball fans that are familiar with core concepts of fantasy baseball, like scoring and positions. Um, you know, there's obviously a fairly steep learning curve for, you know, a lot of our sober MLB players who came over from sober football, um, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, I love to hear all of the stories of folks that are discovering baseball via sober MLB. Like that's that, that warms my heart. Um, but it's certainly a, a learning curve that, um, we can do more and do better in the product to smooth that learning curve, but it exists mostly because the target demographic was fantasy baseball players. So I think you're right to call out that's that's the area where we can and should focus more of our attention in, in convincing those people to, to try something new. As, as you know, the, uh, that demographic can be uh, set in their ways sometimes. And so it's a, it's a challenge to break through for sure. Uh, but there are some things that I'm excited about that we're working on from a partnerships perspective that that will hopefully ease some of that transition. So that's the that's the first area of focus. And then, of course, there's a bunch of other potential cohorts that would be interesting that we think would be interested in the SOAR MLB product. Um, you know, people that were moving over from football, people that are active in the Web3 and crypto space. You know, that's not an area where we have spent the bulk of our time of late, but that's obviously the origin story of, of the company is what blockchain technology has unlocked in terms of um, the provability of the ownership of your assets on, on the platform. Um, and then collectors, you know, that's a large, large market. That's an area that we're interested in pursuing. And you'll see, you know, obviously there's a lot of work for us to do on the product side to improve the collecting aspect of so rare, but you're seeing us take steps in that direction with things like the collection game and the way that we're trying to make that a, a larger part of the product experience. So there's a lot of different ways that we can approach growth and a lot of different cohorts that I think would be interested in the product. But the core of it, you know, has always been we want the best possible fantasy baseball game such that people that are familiar with fantasy baseball have a fairly straightforward learning curve to understand what makes so rare different and, and hopefully better. I was talking to Alex Hooper from So Rare First Pitch, it might have been yesterday, and he was saying that he has a number of people kind of in his community in Europe who had never considered baseball ever until So Rare MLB, and now they're just hardcore So Rare MLB people. And he's like, it's just wild to see because you just don't expect that right away. And obviously, the the people who are most comfortable with So Rare were existing football managers. And so it's not surprising that a lot of that it, the initial user base came from that group. And obviously it's expanded. There are plenty of people who play baseball who have never played football. And that's, I think it's fine. Um, but do you guys think that you have a realistic path to getting more like European players as a, or, is, or are you mostly just focusing on selling the game to Americans? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I do think we have more of a path to onboard more European users, but I think that largely comes via the word of mouth that's driven primarily by the by the football side. Um, we're focused much more so on the American audience for sober MLB in terms of attracting net new users. Obviously, mm -hmm. the support of our European and global community is is critical to the success of, of the business at, at its current state. Uh, and, you know, like I, like I mentioned, I, I love hearing all of the stories of managers that I've spoken with that were introduced to MLB as a, as a product and baseball as a sport via server MLB. Like that's, that's fantastic for me to hear. Um, but, you know, America is really where the, the focus is in terms of onboarding brand new people with the hope that we get to a point where we're, we're actually moving users across all of our sports. You know, it doesn't matter whether you discover so rare via MLB or NBA or football. Uh, we think we're building something that if you find one interesting, you're, you're probably going to find the others interesting as well. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I was thinking back of when so rare MLB launched and just internally at so rare data, we were talking about it and it, 
probably comes as little surprise that most people at Sorter Data had no idea about baseball. And so just going through the basic questions of like, well, how many points do you get for catching a pop-up? And it's like, oh, no, uh, <laughs> none, but but we'll get to that. Um, so yeah, very different games. But um, I want to jump into the reward conversation. You brought it up at the beginning, mostly that people want to talk about it or want to hear about it, excuse me. You The announcement made kind of a point that you guys are going to essentially decide player tiers a little differently than you have been, or at least using a little more information about it. Can you give us a little more detail on it? Not that we need to know the exact formula, but I think there were essentially the, the complaint that yep. most people have are basically like, why is this guy in tier one or whatever tier it is? And so if you could just speak a little bit on what you guys are doing to shut us up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, three things. So first of all, as as I think many in the community have, have ascertained, the tiers are developed through an algorithm that we run internally that takes a bunch of inputs and figures out the rough hierarchy of players based on a, a variety of factors. So the first thing that we're doing is we're just improving and increasing the inputs into that algorithm. So there's data points that it was not considering last year that it will consider for this year. Um, so that should help, you know, more, more data helps for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that we're doing is that one of the very clear uh, outlier types, archetype of outlier in tiers has been players that are very recently introduced to the player population. Mostly that takes the form of rookies, which makes it particularly challenging because often those rookies do maintain that elevated value relative to their scoring, um, but sometimes they don't. And so it's hard sometimes to, in an automated way, separate the signal and the noise from that, where here's a rookie whose price is elevated because they're a hot prospect and their score hasn't caught up to their reputation, but maybe it will eventually. And if we had 100 more data points, we'd have the same result versus here's a rookie who is only elevated because we've sold you know three of their cards instead of 300 of their cards and so we're not really sure uh at what value to place them so that's you know that's a challenge because you know not all not all of these cars not all these players are created equally so what we're trying to do is just be a little bit more methodical about how and when we introduce new players to tiers and have more of a latency between when they're introduced to the auction market and when they're introduced to rewards to give us more opportunity to get more data points and more signal around what their true value is. Because uh, often it, it can take longer um, than, than you know, the game week that from when we start selling them to when we start rewarding them. Um, so that's the second one. And then the third piece is we've always had some degree of manual oversight of those tiers. Um, but we're going to make sure moving forward that now that we've identified what the potential outliers are, it's easier for us to take a manual pass and be more stringent about removing players from tiers, even if just temporarily, if we feel mm -hmm. like their tier value is not reflective of what we think the market will evolve to think. And that's always... Um, the challenge with that is that it's more subjective and we prefer as much as possible to have objective measures of, of player value. We don't, we don't want to be setting the market here, right? That's mm -hmm. the part of the ethos of how prices are set is that the, the market dictates that we, we don't. Um, so it's always a little bit uncomfortable to be more subjective with these tiers for, for that reason. Um, but that being said, we can make subjective judgments like, this doesn't look right. I will temporarily remove this player until we have enough data to prove whether this was right or wrong from a valuation perspective. Um, so all of those things are, are in flight right now. The other thing that I'll say is we do intend to open up tiers publicly prior to game week one starting, probably far, you know farther in advance than just a day, but we'll, we'll see as this mm -hmm. algorithm develops. Um, I expect that tiers will continue to improve incrementally over the course of the season. Uh, so it's it's challenging because you know we've been talking up these changes that we're making to make them more sound, and then there will be some form of big reveal in in the product when they're available. And even with all of the work that we've done to date, 
that will probably that'll probably be the worst the tiers are for season three, right? right? Yeah. Because uh, every time you get more data, you get more accurate, and every game week will have more data than we had the game week before. So this should continue to improve. Uh, but my hope is that when we open them for game week one of season three, they they feel more accurate and more reflective of player value than they did in in season two. Okay. Um, Hilo here in the chat was saying, why is the true value not the price that they're being traded at on market? It feels like adding complexity is more harmful than good. And I feel like the answer you just gave kind of uh, answers this, but it's more the uh, true value of a card that has that they've sold three of versus 30 of is just different. And so um, I think the idea hopefully is recognizing those uh, those players who only have a few cards sold and maybe they are, you know, you get the one of kind of increase, maybe the two is a Jersey, you know, whatever it is. And so, yeah, just getting more sales at least allows us to get a more uh, reasonable value versus other players who have sold that many cards. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the core is that there's, there's liquidity variance, right? Some, some cards trade much more frequently than others, both in terms of auction prices and on the secondary market. And so, um, a one size fits all approach doesn't really work because you're you're weighing a card that might have dramatically less or more liquidity against another one. And when we want to put all of these players in some uniform hierarchy, we need more data points in order to do that as as accurately as possible. Uh, speaking of the auctions, actually, somebody earlier, I apologize, I can't find it, but noted that there were a few players that haven't been minted yet. I think Bryce Harper was one. Uh, apologies, I couldn't find the others. But uh, obviously, people are ready to start some collections. I remember the <laughs> example might have been tweeted, actually, or also, oh, Zach Wheeler. So I was like, all right, Phillies fans trying to get his collection going. Um, what's the what? What's going on with those? Like, are we should we expect those before opening day or? Yeah, what's those in particular, yes. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why individual players may be slower to hit the market than others. Uh, in some cases, there's. Uh, data and the card that's not accurate, you know, position designations that we want to make sure are reflective of our expectations for the season. Um, some cases, players weren't participating in media days and spring training. And so there's latency in getting their photos and getting the cards prepared. There's approval processes that we need to go through with our partners to make sure that all the cards are ready to go. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, like, uh, Yoshi Yamamoto specifically, which I know has been called out as, as a missing player. In some cases, we're restricted from selling cards of players until they've made their official MLB debut as well. So in the example of him, uh, you will not see any cards of his listed prior to game week one, but shortly after game week one, we will be. Uh, and so there are a couple other you know prospects that may or may not break uh, camp with the team that we won't sell prior to them making their official MLB debuts. The other thing that we were trying to do heading into this season is, um, you know, we opened auctions much further in advance of season start this year than, than we did last year uh, for a variety of reasons, primarily, you know, recognizing that with new season card requirements for the new champion competitions, we wanted to give people more time to, to fill their 2024 collections. But that also introduces more risk from like an accuracy of player population perspective and the combination of that, the in-season card requirements, plus the introduction of the collection game, which is incentivizing people to fill out team collections. We didn't want to, or at least we wanted to minimize cases where we began minting cards of a particular player with a particular team. And then they ended up not making the major league team out of camp. They changed teams. And now you're in a position where you may have only minted two, three, four limited cards of a player and no rare cards. And now you need to have that player if you want a full team collection. And so we were much stricter about what players we began minting this far out. And we were going to continue to introduce new players to the auctions as we get more certainty around how opening day rosters will look. So my expectation is come opening day, we'll see another influx of you know new serial number ones hitting the marketplace as we know with more certainty who's going to be on the opening day roster. Um, we had to make some educated guesses around who we expected to make the team. And in some cases, it's pretty clear. In many others, uh, it's less clear. Um, yeah. So we were trying to manage that as well. So that's why the overall player population that we've minted in auctions is 
much lower than it will be come season start. It's it's for a variety of those reasons. I'll say it it did feel early this year, earlier than it had been, whether it was or not. I mean, I guess we've only have we only had last year as the to yeah <laughs> the situation where we started the season. But I will say that the transition period of waiting until game week 10 to get like the full in-season requirements is great. Like I I really appreciated that. We're those of us who play football are quite excited to find out what's going to happen in August uh, in terms of that, because it's just a very different situation. But in the end, like we still need the cards as early as possible. Um, speaking of selling the cards, you guys have started the instant buys for limiteds. Is yeah. there any thought of doing them for rares and super rares this season? Uh, the short answer is yes, there is thought around it. Uh, it's something that, you know, as you move up in scarcity, obviously it's, it's more challenging because you have less, less data points to price those at. Um, so it's something we're actively pursuing, particularly at the rare level. And and I don't want to make any promises around what, when or whether that sure. will roll out, but it's, it's actively something that we're looking at. Um, as we move up to the super rare level, it's it's less clear whether that's something that we're going to want to do. Obviously, the maximum in counts for those cards is, is quite small for this season. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we manage the supply of that carefully. So if it were to roll out, I would expect that to be to be later on. Uh, but it is something that we're looking at for sure. I think the instant buy has been um, well received overall by the community as a mechanism for you know, not having to wait you know, eight hours for the auction of the player that you want to expire, um, pay a little bit of a premium to get them get them right now and not have to stress through the, the end of the auction period. So I think it will it, it definitely adds value, I think, in both directions. Uh, but it just it gets a little bit more challenging as you move up in scarcities to make sure that uh, they're handled correctly. But it's something we're working on. Cool, cool. Uh, there was a question before about, let's see, Tyler said, are there any potential bonus for no hitter perfect games? Walk off RBI Grand Slam, 10Ks and under three runs, almost like a double double in football. I guess the real question is, did you guys have any thoughts of kind of scoring or gameplay changes coming into this season? We obviously had the the relief pitcher appearance change from season one to season two. Were there any thoughts of, of making more changes for season three? Yeah, it's something that we looked at and ultimately decided that it wasn't it wasn't necessary at this time. For the most part, we want to make changes to gameplay that that we think will have um, material impact on the long term health of the game. So that was the that was the impetus for the relief appearance addition last season. Is we recognized that we could get into a position where it wasn't just about you know the the Spencer Strider relief pitcher card from season one. Uh, we didn't want to evolve to a meta where there were ultimately going to end up being enough relief pitchers relief pitcher cards in starting roles that it felt like there was only one viable strategy for winning sober MLB, which is to have a relief pitcher card that's going to start that game week. Yeah. Cause there were just at some point there would be sufficient supply of, of those cards strider or otherwise. Um, and the main goal that I, that I always have for gameplay of sober MLB is that there, there should never only be one strategy, right? That's, that's not that interesting. Um, so that was the main reason for that change is there, you know, there are other ways that we could have approached that decision. Uh, you know, the, the precedent and how the product works otherwise is that you just wouldn't get any points for a start. If you play them in a relief pitcher slot, you only get points for uh, relief appearance. That would have been uh, a much more aggressive nerf to mm -hmm. Strider in particular, but all of the other cards in, in that situation. Um, so we ultimately decided that wasn't that wasn't the right approach. That would be far too limiting for those relief pitcher cards that you then couldn't play in a relief pitcher slot, couldn't play in a starting pitcher slot either. Um, so we felt like this was, you know, the relief appearance was the best way to bridge that gap that was really about making sure that the game could evolve in a way that that didn't push towards one strategy being the only way to be successful. Um, and then for this season, we didn't really feel there were any changes that were that were that required. We made a couple other tweaks last season um, around stolen bases and caught stealings. Uh, those were reflections of the rule changes that Major League Baseball made and trying to be uh, proactive about that. Um, so nothing really changed materially in this past off season that led to uh, the need for scoring changes. That being said, you know, things like no hitter bonus, uh, complete game bonus, 
perfect game bonus, like all of those things have been raised by the community and something that we that we take on and not something that we're opposed to moving forward. Um, so certainly scoring changes may happen. Um, we announced uh, in our season launch blog that we would likely, we, we intend to only make gameplay changes in two different windows of the year. Uh, scoring change, like introducing uh, no hitter bonus or something like that. I don't think it's something that we would try to do mid season, frankly. Um, you know, the, we would really like to reserve yeah. changes that are that substantial or, or that might impact gameplay to that extent uh, to the off season. So uh, if we were to introduce that, which I, I certainly wouldn't rule out, I would, I would expect that to be a, a season four thing. As someone with a Spencer Strider starting pitcher relief pitcher card, I was crushed at the at the slight nerfing, uh, but glad to hear it wasn't a total nerf. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it made total sense. That card did seem a little, not a little overpowered, just completely. <laughs> it was the meta card. You said it yourself. Yes. Yeah. Um, Alex Hooper, what's up, Hoop, said, would still love to see catchers as a standalone position. They don't have a ton of utility otherwise and would help their market. It does seem like that's the one position that may, that just gets overlooked because because they're catchers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, so I would say, you know, a few things on that one, there's, there's a, always a balance that we try to strike in around approachability of gameplay and depth of gameplay. Uh, it's a, it's a challenging balance to strike, but it's the reason why you need seven cards in server MLB as opposed to 11, you know, starting pitcher and a reliever in every single individual position. Um, you know, there's a, there's a balance to strike where, we need to have a reasonable barrier to entry to start playing, right? You need enough, you need enough cards. Um, and that's for people that are in the game and have been playing it for a long time. You know, there's a point where it feels like you're kind of graduating out of this. Like I, I get, I get how the positions work. I get that I have my seven cards. Um, but for a new, a new user, obviously seven by seven individual cards to construct your lineup is a, is a decent hurdle. Uh, right. So, we're trying to manage that and, and we'll continue to try to manage that. There are other ways that we can introduce uh, individual position utility. And I recognize catchers in particular would, would benefit from this. And so that when we reference things like special weeklies coming, you know, I think that's a, a prime opportunity for us to play around with position constructions or scoring constructions that might lend incremental utility to particular positions, particular player, player archetypes, um, things like that. Like you've seen on the, on the NBA side, that's, that's one of the things that we try to do with the special weeklies is mess around with scoring requirements that might benefit one type of player more so than another type of player. Um, just to see, you know, to continue to drive new strategies for being successful in gameplay. So I do think that's something that we're going to explore, but Carving catcher out as a separate standalone position, probably not, probably not imminent. That's all right. We'll just wait for the catcher's only special weekly. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get fired up for that. Uh, so one of the things that you guys included in the blog was about, it was titled Crystal Clear Progression. And it feels like the, the idea of progression has changed a little bit. And it started on the football side, and it, I think, almost feels like it was copy and pasted into the baseball side for the announcement at least, but it feels like the, the p progression path now is less about using lower scarcity cards to win higher scarcity cards and more using lower scarcity cards to win cash or to win new cards, to win cash and use that cash to buy the higher scarcity cards. Is that, is that the way that you guys see the progression now? Because, um, We'll have a follow-up to that, but let, let's start with that. <laughs> sure. Um, so we think about progression in two different ways. Uh, so there's there's horizontal progression and there's vertical progression. Horizontal progression is what you're alluding to, where within the context of one scarcity, there's a very clear loop of, I use my old season cards to win cards that allow me to play in the new season that allows me to win cash, which I can then reinvest in more new cards that I can play across all of those competitions and continue to try to build my gallery via the classic competitions and win some return on that via the, the champion competitions. So that's, that's horizontal progression. And that was certainly in the launch announcement for season three, given that that is 
a new development in SOAR MLB and really for, for SOAR yeah. across the board. That has been the priority is reinforcing how that progression mechanism works. But there's also vertical progression, which, you know, the earlier seasons of SOAR was SOAR MLB was more focused on, right? The, I can play limited pro to win a rare card that allows me to graduate to rare all-star where I can use some of those limited cards in my collection and augment them with the rare cards to level up to rare pro, which is full scarcity where I can win a super rare card. That, that progression is still in place on the MLB side. It has been clearly like impacted by the, the card rewards decreasing as a result of the, the capped mint counts, as we, as we talked about earlier. But that's still an area of progression that's super important to us. So an area where we, we want to continue to figure out the best mechanisms to allow people to progress up scarcities. Uh, I think that was something that we did very well in previous seasons of server MLB, but given the focus for this season being on getting people comfortable with an understanding of the new horizontal progression model, that's, that's where the majority of the focus went. Um, but both, both models of progression remain super important to, to us and we're going to continue to, to tweak them. So, um, so is all-star, like, is the idea that all-star will always be kind of a mixed scarcity competition as a progressive mode to the others? Right now, there's no intention on, on to change that. I think the, the value of having some mixed scarcity competitions to enforce that, to reinforce that vertical progression is, is important and something that, that I like quite a bit as, as how the, the competitions are constructed. Um, obviously that, that could change at some point. Um, we did change the requirements for pro and for AL and NL only last season to make them full scarcity. Yep. Um, and I think the, the theme is generally that mixed scarcity is it's more challenging uh, from a balance perspective. And so there's, there's value in having single scarcity be the default. But that being said, I, I like the fact that you can leverage the cards that you're winning at a higher scarcity and still still build lineups with them uh, with, in a mixed scarcity competition. Um, so there are no near-term plans. Specifically, it's, you know, it's rare all-star and super rare all-star that allow you to, to play up from, from the preceding scarcity. Um, there's no immediate plans to make changes to that. And that's something that would fall under the category of if we were to change that, it would happen in that all-star break window or heading into next season. That would be, in, in my mind, a, a material enough gameplay change that we would want to signal ahead of time when when that was coming and and hit one of our dedicated windows for, for gameplay changes with it. So this next one kind of goes along with that. And not that it doesn't apply to a lot of people, but most people are not playing at this level. But the inability to win the best super rares in the super rare division. Um, what's the, I mean, I would assume the reasoning is that there are just only so many tier one super rares that you can reward throughout a season, but the, the fact that you literally cannot win them unless you play in the unique division, is that hindering those, like the, the people who want to play in the super rare division I think people are, some are hesitant because they're like, I, I cannot win the best prizes there. Yeah, I, we hear that. And I think it's something that we're, we're going to take a look and, and assess, you know, the, the impact of that decision. Um, like you mentioned, it's, there's only so many tier one super rares and we want to, we want to make sure that the supply of them is, is well managed. You know, they're the, some of the most important cards in the game. Um, but you know, that being said, that means they're also some of the most compelling rewards in the game. And so there's a balance that, um, perhaps wasn't, wasn't appropriately struck. So it's something that we're, that we're going to take a look at. Um, the other thing that I'll, that I'll note, I've, I've mentioned this before, uh, but I'll just reiterate the core competition structure that we announced for game week one is the competition structure for game week one, which, okay. which may not be the competition structure for game week five or game week 10. Um, meaning nothing that we announced is going to go away. Um, but it's also not the full final picture. 
So there are other opportunities to use cards and win additional cards with them. You know, we're, we're still working through some of the specifics of, like I mentioned, the timing of when special weeklies are going to be introduced and what appropriate rewards look like there in a way that is compelling and scalable and drives people to participate in these special competitions because I firmly believe that that's that they're going to be fun and strategic and interesting for people to participate in but we want to we need to incentivize that that excuse me we need to incentivize that participation as well so it's a it's a core area of focus for us heading into post game week 1 uh, to make sure that when we do introduce special weeklies they're they're properly incentivized and so keep in mind that when we're talking about the overall reward levels that's necessarily we've withheld some of that reward pools to make sure that special weeklies are compelling okay that makes sense did you guys consider uh, allowing multi-entry at all uh yes and i expect that we will introduce multi-entry in some capacity this season um i expect around the all-star break that's something we would add it's possible that we pull that forward depending on a bunch of different factors. Um, but the short answer is multi-entry was considered. We felt like the, the timing was not right. There's a, there's enough changing uh, for yeah. game week one in the horizontal progression model. Um, but I think it is uh, to, to a certain extent an inevitability that it comes to server MLB and it's uh, it's getting the timing right more than, more than anything, but, but yes. And, and I expect it will happen. And is that for all the competitions or just the champion ones that require the new season cards? To be to be determined. <laughs> <All right. laughs> the yeah, that, that sounds great. There are a few people in the chat. I I think we the the nature of card collecting just feels more like card collecting when it comes to baseball. I think just because of the nature of base literal baseball baseball card collecting and just having so many cards left over is not the best experience. And I, I mean, you guys know that. And so it's not, um, that's not new. And so being able to use them is great. The one question actually came up. Somebody brought this up to me minutes before we started and about the rule to not allow a, a full team stack that you mm -hmm. have to have a second team. What, what's the reason for that? <laughs> Um, the very short answer, and I, I want to, I need to be probably somewhat cautious with my words, but there are, uh, there are regulatory requirements, uh, at a state by state level that, yep. uh, demand different things from gameplay and having a universal gameplay experience that applies to all of our players is, is critical. And so there are concessions and compromises that we need to make sometimes in order to maintain that. I think you nailed that answer. <laughs> <laughs> try to be try um, to be uh, thoughtful and and not giving away more than than I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, DJ, in um, first off, uh, thanks so much for taking all this time. I'm I'm sure this has already gone longer than you were expecting, but um, we just have a lot of questions. People are excited. So, um, but DJ said, "Will the special contest be for just one game week, or could there be week month long?" And I I think the the announcement did say that there will be some longer form competitions. Um, obviously, we had the championship chase last year. Do you envision regular season longer form stuff too? Yes, yes. Um, we definitely do. Uh, timing of that, similar to the rest of the special weeklies, is is something that we're working on. But but yes, I, those were well received in the form of the championship chase. It's it's. Uh, something that we've heard a lot of community feedback around uh, and the desire to have more of these longer format competitions. I think it, it maps well to the spirit of, of baseball, which is, you know, it's a long season and it's very incremental. And so the idea of, you know, chipping away at a leaderboard over the span of, of multiple game weeks, I think is appealing. So uh, absolutely something that's, that's on the table for this season. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the only question and I meant to ask this earlier, so I apologize that it's so out of place here, but back to the, the tiering question, actually. Do you guys have a, a certain number of players that you put in tier one? Is it like a percentage? And I, I know that on the football side, they basically say it's the, well, I guess the new one for 
Premier League was five percent or whatever the numbers are. Is that do you have that number? Because that kind of went back to the whole if you can't win tier one super rares, like reasonably how many players is that that they would be missing out on? Yeah, it's a it's a percentage of the overall player pool, and it it needs to be basically for for supply management reasons. Right. Um, so in order for us to make sure that we have sufficient circulating supply and that the rewards are sufficiently spread out that you know everybody isn't getting the exact same card, and then we we run through the maximum supply of one player much faster than another player just because of the reward tiers. Um, so it, it needs to be set as a, as a percentage of the player population. Okay. That, that does vary based on, because the, right. the uh, circulating player population varies, right? There, right now, we're only minting about 500 players at the moment because of all the reasons that I alluded to. There sure. are a number of reasons why there, there are players that have been withheld, some intentionally by us, some, some outside of our control for the time being, but will be added in, in, incrementally. Um, the maximum player population we could ever have at any given moment is 780. That's the number of active roster players in Major League Baseball. Uh, roster turnover happens frequently enough that that it's unlikely that we ever get to that total number. But we do generally try to have around six, 700 players uh, available in circulating supply across auctions and instant buy and, uh, and in reward tiers. Um, so the number of players in tier one changes as a result of what the overall yep. player population is. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Uh, all right. Final thing. And you touched on a little earlier about collections. Will we see kind of collection competitions at all that uh, those who have kind of top collections are rewarded for building those? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I would say we, we are very invested in collections as a concept and we want to do more to reward our collectors for participating in, in team collections. Um, so we, we are exploring multiple different avenues for delivering on, on that. You know, obviously there's the immediate gameplay utility of completing a collection or, or building out a collection of yeah. the, the gameplay bonus that you get. Um, but similar to, you know, some of my answers on other things, like I don't think our job is done yet. You know, there's more, there's more for us to do to pay off that collection mindset, which we want to continue to reinforce in the product. And that comes from a variety of ways, whether that's in the form of, you know, collection specific competitions or whether that's in the form of, you know, rewards or surprise and delight moments for people that hold a particular collection or meet particular thresholds. All of those things are, you know, on the table and things that we're exploring. But the the short answer is we care a lot about collections. We want our users to care as much about collections as we do because we think they're really they're really interesting and powerful and fun. And the feeling of completing a collection uh, is something that we want to do more to to pay off. Uh, so it's it's an area that we're focused on. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I said that was the last thing, but then some questions came in. So I'm going to have to keep yeah. you uh, a little longer, but I did like this one. Uh, so the rules for the champion competitions in terms of the number of in-season cards, do you see that increasing throughout the season? We obviously have the increase uh, after game week 10 or for game week 10, excuse me, will subsequent game weeks make you need more in-season cards? Yeah. Good question. Um, I would say we we've reserved the right to increase that specifically at the all-star break. I don't anticipate doing that this mm -hmm. season. Um, my expectation and the expectation of, of the team when we constructed that game week one to game week 10 ramp was that the game week 10 was, was our end state for, for the season. Um, so that's, that, that should be the assumption if that were to change, it would be communicated well ahead of time and would not take effect before the all-star break. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make promises yeah, months sure. in the future, um, but that is not, that was not our expectation and our intention of setting up the requirements in game week 10, that the expectation is that that would be uh, the final state for the at least for the season. All right. I will make this the last one and only because, oh, and then another one comes in, um, <laughs> but I specifically, because Ben said, I don't follow baseball outside of so rare. 
Um, <laughs> but basically, have you considered anything for the off season, like international baseball or something else? And then Alex is looking for uh, Japanese and Korean baseball. So has there been <laughs> any thought instead of so rare MLB to be so rare baseball? Um, I, I will just say it's not a, it's not a priority or focus for us right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that it, it never will be in the future, but, but for right now, I think we've got, um, we've got enough to do on the MLB side to, to make sure that that game is as good as it can possibly be and living up to the, to the expectations of, of our fantastic community. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to spread our focus too thin. I think that's the right answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. You said you have a lot of work to do, so um, <laughs> um, I'll let you uh, do that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, in the chat. Also, to everybody who submitted some questions before. And Everett, um, I think we're all getting really excited for the upcoming season. I think you guys have put together a really engaging game that uh, already has a, a lot of passionate uh, people playing, including those who literally didn't know anything about baseball uh, before So Rare. So um, it's really fun to watch. And so thank you so much for that and, and all the uh, answers to our questions. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the season and, and thanks everyone who, who joined. Uh, feel free. I'm always available. If you want to reach out to me on, on Twitter at uh, Evercase, um, send me a message and, and we can chat more baseball. Here they come, Everett. Here they come. Yeah, Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs>